as well. With that, we'll call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for November 9th, 2020. Um, our first order of business is approval of the agenda. If there, nobody has any changes or additions to the agenda, we can move or, or go ahead and approve that without um, a motion. Does anyone have any changes or additions? All right, seeing none, we'll uh, say the agenda is approved. Next order of business is approval of the minutes from the October 26, 2020 meeting. Did anyone have changes or additions to those minutes? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Cummings moves approval. Moved by Cummings, is there a second? Zarin seconds. Seconded by Zarin. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Sterner. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye, and I note that Council Member Sterner gave a thumbs up. I think Got you it. might have an audio issue. All right, with that, the minutes are approved. Next, we're on to the TAC report. We have David Finley here today. Welcome, David. Hello, everybody. Um, Chair Barber, committee members, thank you for having me again uh, this month. I know I missed last month, but I hope Daryl did a great job. Um, not a lot to update you on this month, but uh, I did want to say since um, uh, our TAC was updated on uh, the Green Line Extension Project uh, just last week, that uh, throughout the, um, almost the entire um, um, project, the Green Line Extension team has done really an absolutely fantastic job of uh, not only engaging TAC in the disability community, but actually listening to us and implementing many of the stuff that uh, that, that we suggested. I'm not just saying this because uh, Jim is on the line. Um, I'm saying this because I think that you all should should know this and, and potentially hold up the way that they engaged uh, TAC um, as an example for other projects and for the Met Council and Metro Transit in general. So that is all I have to say. Thank you very much for having me. I'll stick around. Actually, one more thing, one more thing. So since I haven't been doing this for very long, um, I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious if there are things that you would like uh, for me to bring to this meeting. Um, um, if so, you don't have to say it now. You can maybe go through through Chair Barber. Um, just just so I can bring information to you that you want to hear rather than talk about the stuff that, that, that TAC's been doing. So just want to plant that seed. And, and feel free to, to forward that information onto me if, you, if you'd like. But again, thanks for having me. Hey, thank you, David. Um, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Finley, thank you so much for the reports that you do make. I, for me as a council member, I, I find it very interesting to hear what TAC has been up to and what, uh, what you are going over in your meetings and so forth and clearly the um, input that you put into all of our projects is extremely important, but I'm really, really happy to hear that that Mr. Alexander and the Green Line has been really receptive to what you've offered because it makes for a better project. And that is what we're shooting for. So thank you for the work that you and your committee do. And um, I really appreciate your updates. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions or comments from council members? All right, I'm, I'm just gonna echo what Molly said that I really appreciate uh, the feedback that we're, um, that we're hearing, that you provided us uh, for Southwest LRT. I know that we really tried to work with TAC and I'm glad that you're seeing that positive results from that because I do think that the input that TAC provides really does help us deliver a better product um, to the communities that we're serving. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think that, you know, um, the, I, I really am happy we've um, started having TAC report at transportation committees. So I think it provides us some good insight 
um, because we don't always get to attend those meetings, especially in our current environment. So it's really helpful. And I think that um, things that, especially if you guys come to things where you have issues or questions that you want raised up to the committee level, um, I think, you know, definitely don't hesitate to bring those things up up to us as well, because I think that's helpful because uh, the way that we work together is we do want to um, uh, bring in the advice um, that your committee is 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 talking about and issues that they're identified. So that's just my two cents. So, but thank you, David. Perfect. So with that, we're next on to other reports. We have um, uh, MTS Director Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Right. So uh, again, today, the Governor's Blue Ribbon Committee met. Uh, they concluded just about 15 minutes ago. Um, they're they're getting near the end of their um, charge to have a report to the governor by the end of the year. I think they have two more meetings. Today they heard presentations from our council's chief counsel's office, Dave Tyson, kind of uh, wrapping up some issues that were raised at the last meeting, questioning uh, kind of the status of the Met Council and the, as the region's MPO. Um, uh, Dave Tyson was able to go to clarify any issues that were raised, go through the legislative history uh, at the federal and state level and review the determination that has been made by USDOT that does show that the council is the official MPO of the region. And it appeared there was consensus by the Blue Ribbon Committee that that is not an issue they will be putting in their report as a potential issue. I think they were satisfied with the presentations today. The second uh, presentation made to them, they had a requested presentation that I made on the differences between our Metro Mobility State Service and similar service for those with disabilities in greater Minnesota. Um, it was part of some of the recommendations they were thinking about uh, that came up today. Um, we're able to show that Metro Mobility is uh, roughly 10 times the size of the paratransit service in the rest of Minnesota in both budget and ridership. And we also have significant differences in how we operate. And a lot of this is because of state law uh, dictating where our service area, how we deliver the service, and, and which communities are part of it that really sets aside the differences between us and in Greater Minnesota, which is governed mo almost always by federal uh, laws for disability services. So I think that was a presentation that led to, is going to lead to a maybe a recommendation or two about Metro Mobility. Um, and then the bulk of the meeting was about each of the committee's members was given three minutes to kind of give a status check of where they are in terms of the main questions the committee has been asked. So they went around the room and um, gave their opinion on a variety of topics uh, that's been charged with. I think um, there'll be a, and then so for the next time we'll, we'll draft those up and they'll start to really refine what the committee is going to recommend, but they discussed there didn't seem to be any support for having elected members on the council. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about staggered terms and some discussions about the transit governance. Uh, and so that'll be the next meeting will really be around trying to further refine what their recommendations will be. Um, so that committee continues on and we continue as the council to support their request for that. And the last update I have is a COVID update is what we've been providing. And for the last two cycles, I've told you how the good news was we hadn't had any positive tests among our contracted uh, transit uh, employees. But last week, we did have four positives among our drivers. Um, not surprising, considering the trends that are occurring in Minnesota, we knew it would catch up with our contracted community too. We have... Um, uh, redoubled our efforts working with the contractors and employees to really reinforce the message about um, what we need to do to keep a safe workplace, but also to reinforce this the fact that we are providing uh, the testing for them at no charge for the employees to get COVID tests. And that's strongly encouraging uh, the use of that if they have any contact or symptoms. And so just redoubling in our efforts with our contracting communities in light of uh, trends that are occurring in Minnesota. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions. I had questions from council members. Madam Chair, could I ask a question? Of course, Councilmember Zarin. Council Member Zarin here. Um, 
just uh, I just want to go over a little review, if we, if we, if you will, uh, of what we do when we find an employee uh, has tested positive for uh, COVID. Um, I apologize for not having my video on here. Um, I'm, get, I'm getting a lot of buffering. I, don't, I hope my audio is coming through okay. Um, I can hear you well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm presuming that we're still doing contact tracing and uh, and asking people to, to get tested, even if they're not showing any symptoms. But I, I just would like to hear uh, how that's been going and uh, an update on that. Thank you. Madam Chair, I can, I'll can i speak from uh, the angle of the contracted con no, contractors. I'll let West uh, cover anything with Metro Transit because of the differences. We have to do slightly different protocols. So uh, first of all, if somebody tests positive, a uh, driver, um, we uh, go back and do contract tracing. On, we For most of the contracted services, we know the customers on the bus because it's Metro Mobility or Transit Link and every one of those customers has booked a ride. So we can do contract tracing to the individual on those routes based on when the driver last rode the bus. Um, and we're following CDC and Minnesota Health guidelines about how far back we need to review the videos uh, for, and then how pr close in proximity any customer was. So that's an advantage that we have in the Metro Mobility and Transit Link because we know every customer that's on the bus we're able to trace it to the customer level and then notify the customers if we've deemed that they've met the threshold for close contact, we do notify them uh, directly uh, uh, so that they uh, become, become aware and can also get tested. And then for our contractors, um, we have protocols in place following those guidelines about um, they're all having temperature checks when they arrive on site. They're all being um, going through safety protocols about what symptoms are, what to do if they feel they have any symptoms. We have all the testing set up so they're, they know uh, where they can go get tests at any time. And then they're asked to isolate. And then we do not do the contract tracing ourselves for employees, um, but that is uh, what would like the Minnesota Department of Health would do through their contract tracing but those notification of positive tests um, and who they are are being submitted uh, to the Department of Health for contract tracing. So we have pretty good strong protocols and the advantage of the fact that we do know who our customers are for most of our contracted services uh, that are not fixed route services. Um, and then we have a lot of protocols around cleaning, which I think we've mentioned before uh, that are based on the recommendations, but we are cleaning uh, Metro Mobility and Transit Link between customer trips and trying to do and have a lot of protocols around minimizing close proximity of anybody on a bus. So um, that's in general the overview, but uh, uh, we've had those protocols in place for a while now. It's just now I think we're expecting more positives just because of what's happening in the community spread at this point. Does that answer your questions on that? Uh, Madam Chair, if I could have a follow-up question. Um, yeah, I, I know, ahead. Mr. Thompson, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of focusing on you, but this really could, uh, could be anybody in the system uh, or any part of our business could, uh, could uh, answer this question really. So, has there, has, do you know if there's any testing that's going on out there that, uh, in the bus itself? Uh, that uh, could assure the, that our, our customers that we've got this thing uh, nailed down and that uh, it's not being transferred. Um, is there any way to assure our customer? We do the cleaning, we right. do the contact tracing, we do the, the testing. Uh, is there a study uh, commission that would assure our customers and give them confidence to come back? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member, we, we, the Council are not doing the studies, but we, what we are doing is closely monitoring all the studies all the, uh, and what is happening. There's a network of transit agencies at the national level that are basically in communication um, and sharing information and taking uh, information about what we're learning 
about how transmission occurs, adapting our protocols to it, but also understanding the risk. Um, and I think um, I kind of defer to Wes a little bit about on, on this, but um, where we're at today about how safe it is to travel in transit compared to where we were in March, um, I think we've come a long ways. And I think we can have some confidence that if our customers are wearing masks and following proper social distancing on bus, that transit is a safe a mode of travel in our region um, because of the protocols and partly what we've learned about transmission, the disease uh, or the virus today compared to you know, several months ago. Um, General Manager Kleister, did you mind to make a comment? I sure. I said uh, off mute. Um, uh, with respect to, to protocols, much of, much of the same protocols we have in place at Metro Transit as was described by uh, uh, Nick Thompson, and that is that if we have a positive case, we do immediate contact tracing. For those that have had contacts that meet the criteria of, of health department guidance and, and CDC guidance, they're asked to quarantine for the for the for that period of time. It's a fairly rigorous process, and 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 there's a lot of detailed steps in it, and we follow all the guidance by the health department. And ensuring that anybody who has uh, a positive test in our organization uh, is a, is a, is a, is a not allowed to come back to work until they've gone through the quarantine process, and we do the contract tracing as, as described. With respect to assuring customers that our buses are safe, I think there's been studies out that have suggested that there's no evidence that there's widespread. Uh, 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 there's the that COVID is is spread on on transit facilities. But we also, I need to also honestly say we have had CDC guidance lately that have talked about uh, the about approaching uh, transit as a a public space of a shared public space and 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 administering all the required guidance in those spaces. Of course, we do with our social distancing. Of course, we do with the added buses. Uh, but there's also becoming a greater greater emphasis. On the use of masks, which I'll be addressing uh, later in my remarks. So, I don't want to say that that we can guarantee our customers that riding transit is safe. Uh, I uh, in terms of of risk of pandemic, that's why our message is still out to use transit uh, as as necessary, but not use transit as a choice if there's other choices available. That is still our message. And we're going to be, I don't like delivering that message, but we're going to be as cautious as possible. We, of course, also have the bus cleaning and disinfecting protocols. We have separation of our drivers from customers with barriers. Uh, uh, and, and, I've, and as I've mentioned, the other social distancing and and and, uh, and flooding uh, areas with, with more buses than are necessary to, to help social distancing along. But it's still something we have to manage it's still something we need to be careful about and it's still something um, that, that that we're going to keep our sights on health department guidance and cdc guidance uh, as we go forward thank you uh council member zarin did you have any additional follow-up questions i'm thank you chair barber i'm uh, very much satisfied with the explanations that we got i just have to share that i've had family members not in my house but uh test positive for for covid and um and we're uh taking the steps necessary and i i just find it uh to be uh, a little bit of a scary uh, proposition of having my my family members go through this and uh in trying to eliminate that so uh, thanks for the explanation that really means a lot to me thank you thank you council members Aaron, and all of our good healing thoughts to your family members um one thing that might be good um director thompson and general manager Kleister, is there are some articles that are out there talking about um uh covid transmission and transit it might be good to route some of those articles out to the committee I think that would be helpful. It's good information to have, at least as we make decisions moving forward. Okay, sure, um, I'd, be, I'd be happy to do that and, and, and also include the recent CDC guidance we received as well. That would be great. Thank you. Um, additional questions? If not, I've got one for you, um, 
Um, Nick, so you talked about um, the Blue Ribbon Committee that they were talking about changes to Metro Mobility. Did you talk at all about that? I mean, how do how are their conversations aligning with the outcomes of the Metro Mobility Task Force that was done? Um, I think a lot of them are around, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, two things. Number one, since this is a required service that uh, the state should consider funding this uh, on a forecasted budget and not uh, re requiring that we come back to the legislature uh, every two years to supplement that budget. And I, and I think that's something that we've uh, talked about at the council for a while and the task force talked about funding a lot. Um, and so I think that was one of them. There was no discussion about, um, well, there was some questions that we didn't get to that we're going to come back to next week asking um, about the state service boundaries for Metro Mobility mm -hmm. versus federally mandated and asking what are how much money do the state requirements um, add to the budget of Metro Mobility. I think the questions around well what if it was just federally required what would the size of it be but they weren't questioning the value of the Metro Mobility in the state area. And then there were some questions about whether the areas outside of the transit taxing district should be kind of contributing in some way to the funding of Metro Mobility. Um, and those are all questions I do believe the task force uh, talked about. There was nothing really, no questions around service, same day, a lot of the recommendations of the task force around um, providing same day transit that we're now implementing uh, or things like that. It was more around the budget and also trying to highlight that maybe you know, especially compared to Great Minnesota, maybe the funding of it should be looked at differently, like Department of Human Services should have a role and this forecasting, thinking about it in that role, I think they were uh, kind of thoughts around that that might become recommendations. And I don't believe the task force got into that level of source of funding as much. Um, so it could be very complimentary. I don't think there's anything contradictory to what the Metro Mobility Task Force raised. All right, thank you. All right, anything else from council members before we go on? All right, we're gonna switch over to uh, General Manager Koistra. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna start with Metro Transit's COVID update. Uh, we've had a total of 166 employees tested positive for COVID from the start of the pandemic through yesterday. I know there that I've seen two or three new cases come in today. October was our highest month with 53 cases. Uh, before October, August was our highest month with, with 27 cases. Uh, since our last Transportation Committee meeting on October 26th, uh, and this is data through through yesterday, uh, we've had 19 cases. That overlaps, as you can see, a little bit. That's not additive to the October numbers. It overlaps by about five days. Uh, but uh, still, we've had 19 cases. I, I This pretty much aligns with what we're seeing in our region and in our state, uh, and may even be a little little behind that, uh, given the, the number of positive cases we're seeing everywhere right now. Um, if, if you're interested in this by location, uh, the, the 19 cases were, one was at Big Lake, four was, were at East Metro Garage, one at Green Line, uh, three at Haywood Garage, two at Haywood offices, one in, at, at the police department, one at the Nicollet Garage, two in the overhaul base, two at Reuters, one in South and one in Transfer Road. And I mentioned all those because as you can see, they're fairly spread out across our system. I will say uh, that we've had a number of cases at the East Metro garage in the in the, in the uh, maintenance and area. And we have been addressing that uh, uh, with contacts with the health department and protocols. I, and I've been told that those have tailed off in, in recent recent days. So we were having concerns at the, at the East Metro garage. Um, moving on, uh, I mentioned that I'd be speaking with Max com Ma about mass compliance. Uh, we are, we are uh, uh, doing, going to be doing much more with respect to communicating and enforcing mass compliance on our, on our buses and in our facilities. Uh, it is really important right now, given the number of cases that are out there. Um, we began encouraging customers to wear facial coverings in uh, April, and we started requiring facial coverings in May. 
And of course, now as we see all the new COVID cases, we want to make sure that we're basing all our decisions and actions on the latest public health, on the latest public health guidance. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention strongly advises that riders and employees wear masks on public transportation settings. Again, I'll I'll send that guidance out to you with with other information that we have. And while most riders and employees are are complying, I think when we did, I mentioned that this to this group before when we did, reviewed did a survey on buses, um, uh, we were looking at about 85, 87 percent compliance. Uh, recently, the police department has been looking at video on on light rail and have and have determined a, approximately 60 percent compliance on light rail. If you think about where we're at right now, that's not good enough. And it's time, and we, we think it's really important that we start renewing our communication, freshening up our communication, and and creating a, a greater presence with respect to uh, um, communicating our expectation to um, to our riders and, and, and to our employees. So we're taking additional steps to remind everyone uh, that masks must be worn inside public indoor spaces, including our work sites, buses, and trains. In addition to refreshing messages on vehicles and at busy boarding areas, transit police will spend time on bus and rail routes, thanking those wearing masks and providing education and masks for those who don't have them. Uh, we want to start off with education. We want to start out with reinforcing good behavior. Um, but if we have people who repeatedly disregard the state's mask requirement, we may be asked to leave. They may be asked to leave the train uh, or bus. I think this is important. If you think about uh, uh, the ramifications of, of spreading the pandemic and what that does to health and what that does to well-being of people, uh, this is a, this is as important as any other safety issue, or more important than many safety issues that we have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis uh, on our trains and our buses. Inside our workplaces, managers and supervisors are going to be asked to also. Um, uh, communicate more and re remind and require staff to wear a mask. Compliance is really important. That's the message we're hearing from everywhere. And this is our effort to to double down on, on those on those issues. And then finally, I'll mention, I give provide an update on ridership. Uh, overall, our system ridership for the week of October 26th and November 1 was down 66% compared to pre pandemic ridership levels. Uh, bus ridership is down 65%. Blue ridership is down 69%. Green ridership is down 65%. North Star ridership is down 95%. Those are very similar figures to what I've reported here in the past. It's just not changing much. A little improvement on light rail, pretty steady on bus. Um, North Star ridership has been round, down around 95, 96%. Uh, for some some time now, so uh, that's the that's the end of my report, uh, Madam Chair. I'll take any questions or, or comments. You're on mute, I believe. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, General Manager. Um, David, did you have a question? Yes, Madam Chair, co uh, Committee Members. Um, is there is there any consideration yet to uh, start requiring all all riders to wear masks. I know that right now um, you have a policy where if, if an individual says that they can't because of a medical condition or a disability, um, that they don't have to wear a mask. And um, um, as, as far as I know, that that's technically not a right under the ADA. I think public health uh, 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 comes before um, um, people's people's disability rights do. So I'm, I'm just curious if if you all have considered that. Madam Chair and, and Mr. Finley, I, I think that's a really good question. Our, that is our policy now that, that mask compliance is required by all those who can wear masks and we have made exceptions for those uh, that are in the exception list of the governor's emergency orders. Uh, I'll take that question back to, to, the, to our incident command structure about where we should go with that. Uh, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate your comments on the, the balance between uh, between public health interests and and ADA uh, uh, rights and, and 
requirements. And a follow up, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, to, to follow up, I, I know it's, it's been in the news and it's been um, circulating throughout disability circles as well, where uh, this kind of strange phenomenon where people, I, I guess it shouldn't be strange, where people feign disability in order to not have to wear a mask. And there really is no way to prove whether or not they have a disability. Um, that's, it's, it's just another compounding factor. And I, it's kind of a sticky situation for, for, uh, leaders in the disability community, because, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to take away the rights of folks with disabilities. And at the same time, um, when somebody pretends to have a disability to circumvent, uh, a public health mandate, um, it really does it erode our rights as they exist. So. I mean, there's really no right answer here. So that's more of a comment than a question, but just information for you uh, to have. M Madam Chair, I, if I could just ask and uh, through you to Mr. Fenley, whether, uh, whether the disability community has discussed this issue of exceptions for mask requirements and how that should be applied in public spaces. I'd be, I'd be interested if he has any any comments uh, this evening about that, if, if that's okay with you? Absolutely, go ahead, David. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, as it pertains to public transit, I think it's a much tougher situation. Um, if you use an example like a restaurant or a retail store where there's alternative methods to provide the goods and services you know, whether it's curbside or home delivery, um, even in voting, you know, that we did curbside voting, but you, <laughs> that, that same accommodation doesn't really apply to public transit because, you know, what, what are you gonna do? Send out a individual car for each person who requests an accommodation to ride the bus that it, it's just not feasible. Um, so I don't, I mean, I don't have a good answer to your question. I can look into what has, if, if any, research or discussions have happened around public transit but but as it pertains to almost everything else it really is you know uh the business can and should um um demand that people wear masks it, it's pretty much as simple as that you know we don't want somebody who has a disability and is also asymptomatic tromping around spreading COVID. it's as simple as that it's their their disability rights end when um, the the health of other people start to be impacted, um, but it's a whole different ballgame on public transit. So I apologize for not answering your question in a very long way. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. That's really good information. And David, if you if you do come across anything, let us let us know, and you can either reach out to me or to General Manager Quistra. Um, all right. Other questions from council members. All right, seeing none, we can move on with our business for the evening. There are no items on consent tonight, and our first business item is business item 2020-287, which is adopt the 2020 update of the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan and accept the public comments. I believe Amy Benowitz will be speaking to this. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. So I am here today with the final action on the update to the 2020 transportation to the 2040 transportation policy plan. And the action that you have in front of you today is to first accept the public comment report on the update. Um, and just as a quick reminder, we did go through that the comments last month and I'll quickly go through them a little bit today. And then the major part of the action today is that you provide a recommendation to the full council that they adopt the revised 2020 update to the 2040 transportation policy plan. So with that, I have a very short PowerPoint today. Uh, is my audio coming through clear? Otherwise I will turn my video off. It is now. Any it, it was a little... It was a little stuttery when it started, so I'll let you know if that comes back, but right now you're coming through. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my video off till the end of the presentation just to help it a bit. Uh, Greg, if you could go to the next slide. So just as a quick reminder, we had a public comment period that began early this summer and have been going through that process. Um, going through the comments, go our responses to the public comments received, revising the update to the TPP. And then we are here today to get your recommendation and then the full council in two weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said, we did have a very extensive outreach and engagement this summer. Unfortunately, as you all are aware, it was also during COVID and online focused with um, our partners. And we, even though it was online, we received a large number of comments and over 215 commenters. Next slide, please. Uh, last month, we did go over this. We identified three key themes as part of our comment process shown here. Um, and then we received a number of additional comments primarily related to transit, transit safety, investments in transit, bus fleet electrification. And uh, we did a number of changes both for the large comments, the large themes, and also the smaller comments. Next slide, please. So some of the bigger changes that are reflected in the revised update that is before you today. And I should note that we have a summary of the proposed changes by page number and by chapter, and that, that is linked within the business item. So if you do want to see the listing of all the changes that we've made, you can go specifically to that document. But some of the bigger changes that we made, uh, we added text to the overview and to the highway, or to, just to the overview that was part of the finance chapter, talking about the fact that much of our regional transportation funding spending is inflexible between modes primarily. We added text to both the overview and the highway chapter, clarifying that travel demand management, otherwise known as TDM, and land use solutions are really the first priority for solving roadway congestion or mobility issues. And um, that text is kind of scattered throughout the document now. We added a new regional TDM study to be completed in 2021 and 2022 uh, that will look and prioritize actions related to TV, TDM that can help us deal with congestion on our system. We added text to the overview, kind of recognizing the success of teleworking, which is a TDM strategy during the COVID event in reducing highway congestion. And I might add part of that success, even though our travel is coming back, uh, part of that success and another TDM strategy is spreading travel throughout the day and having less defined peak hours, which helps to reduce highway congestion. We added a new study titled Equity Evaluation of Regional Transportation Investments that we hope to complete in 2021 and 2022, and um, have talked with you about that study and also the possibility of using some of the council funding that is available for equity to help us complete that study. We have also been in conversation with MnDOT in, to see their interests in partnering on that study. And then, as I said, we have many smaller changes that we made in response to the comments that are scattered throughout the document and that you can specifically see in the summary of the proposed changes document. Next slide, please. Uh, as a reminder, this is not things that have changed due to the public comment, but we throughout our process of the update have emphasized that the most important change that we were making to the TPP really was in our work program chapter. 
The work program chapter enumerates the studies and policy focus that we're going to have over the next four years prior to the adoption of the next TPP and also the, the update of Thrive 2040. So some of the other work program items that are in the TPP update, accelerating electric vehicle adoption, looking at scenario planning on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and developing a tool for use by our partner cities and counties, re-looking at, as I talked about previously, at how we address congestion and our TDM study will be part of re-looking at that philosophy, studies related to microtransit and shared mobility. We are developing a mobility hub planning guide, updating our regional bikeways transportation network uh, guidelines and how we add corridors to that system. And then also a look at industrial land throughout the region. So those are our primary studies over the next three to four years, along with our ongoing work in the planning process and with TAB. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions about the update to the TPP uh, and then ask that you make a recommendation. All right, any questions from council members? Not a, not a, not a chair, but sure. Go ahead, Councilman. Yeah, not, not um, questions. And, um, I'm really glad that we have such a, is that my background noise? Am I making background noise? I'll mute. Okay. Um, I'm glad that we have um, such a comprehensive um, transportation plan and that we have these ongoing studies so we can continuously improve how we provide transportation services. And, um, you know, I'm just look, looking forward to seeing the results of uh, those studies and especially towards um, more equitable transportation throughout the region. Thank you, Council Member Chambliss. Any other questions or comments from Council Members? Um, just a quick, oh, Council Member Fredson. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair and Amy. I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the industrial mapping tool. Uh, yes, um, Madam Chair and members, this is not really an area I'm super versed in, so I might have to get back to you. That is going to be led by our community development division. And as you may be aware, a few years ago, maybe three years ago, we went through a process of mapping available industrial land um, and kind of analyzing its capabilities of having rail and highway connections. So whether it would be attractive for freight and what we would like to do is kind of keep that up to date through an interactive tool that we would ask uh, the cities and counties to help us continue to add data as land maybe gets developed for other purposes or current freight purposes and that on an ongoing basis we would keep it up to date with um, current data and then also have it available to our partners. And I guess I'm not, I would have to check with community development whether any private developers would also be able to utilize it to identify potential parcels that have good access to freight and rail transportation in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions or comments? Um, just a comment for myself. I just really want to thank Amy and her team and all the people who have been working on this. Um, anytime we do this, even if it's a smaller update, it's a big undertaking. So uh, much appreciated. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-287. 
This is Fredson, so moved. Moved by Fredson, is there a second? Second by Sterner. Second by Sterner, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, Becky, could you call the roll? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, motion carries. Thank you. We're on to our next business item, which is 2020-277, Southwest LRT Civil Construction Change Order. And I believe Jim Alexander is presenting. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, this is Jim Alexander. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, well, thank you. I'm Jim Alexander, uh, Project director for, director for the Southwest LRT. So tonight we have a, a change order for earthwork related to the corridor protection barrier. I think you've uh, heard me talk about this in the past. Uh, this is a requirement for the project and uh, kind of just a recap history on this is uh, as we were getting bids for the civil construction contract back in May of 2018, we were still undergoing an environmental review of this piece for the corridor protection barrier. So that was not included in the original bid package and we need to include it now so that uh, we can meet the uh, requirements of our agreement with BNSF Railway. So this, uh, this uh, earthwork is really a precursor to another change order that we're currently in negotiations with the contractor on for the corridor protection barrier itself. And uh, we need to get this uh, work underway to help uh, uh, cut some time in the overall construction of the corridor protection barrier. And there's a lot of pieces that go involved in this. Uh, uh, essentially, it's a uh, quarter protection barrier is about a little over a mile long, and uh, and there's a lot of pieces to this. Uh, but uh, essentially, we're uh, having the contractor build some access roads uh, for uh, for hauling. There's uh, also access roads along the uh, about 600 uh, drilled shafts that the contractor will have to do eventually, and uh, and we also have to uh, establish a, and maintain a an access road for BNSF uh, Railway as they uh, undertake their rail activities through this area. Uh, structural backfill excavation. Uh, there's infiltration systems associated with this work as well. And so uh, tonight, uh, just like the, we have a proposed action that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator through the Southwest Light Rail Transit Council authorized representative to negotiate and execute a change order for contract 15P307A with London Macross and Joint Venture in an amount not to exceed $10,045,134.47 for earthwork related to the construction of a quarter protection barrier. And I would just add, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, this uh, will uh, will uh, this work will meet the uh, the goal of 16%. Currently, the contractor is just under under 20% uh, uh, through August for their DBE participation. So, with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jim. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-277. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Zarin second. Seconded by Zarin. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next, we're on to business item 2020-290, Transit Master Sole Source Equipment and Software Maintenance and Support Services. We have Teresa Nissler. Good afternoon, Chair Barber and Council Members. Thank you for providing time on your agenda today. My name is Teresa Nissler, Assistant Director of IS Finance and Budget, and I'm here with Gary Nyberg, Manager of Transit Control, and we're here to present business item number 2020-290, the Transit Master Sole Source Equipment and Software Maintenance and Support Services 20P218. Metro Transit has been utilizing the Transit Master system since 2002. The current system maintenance support contract which was extended by council on May 13th, 2020, due to the impact of COVID-19 is now set to expire on December 31st, 
2020. The contract extension has allowed sufficient time for staff to prepare for an ongoing five-year agreement. This application ensures control, safety, and accurate, efficient FTA compliant reporting with real-time interaction between our fleet and our transit control center. From a Thrive perspective, the transit support services agreement is needed to continue the critical transportation services this software provides across the region, and it supports the Thrive outcomes of stewardship and sustainability, which brings me to the proposed action that the Metropolitan Council authorizes the regional administrator to award negotiation and execution of sole source contract with Trapeze Software Group Incorporated not to exceed $10,341,807 for ongoing support and maintenance services for the Transit Master Transportation System. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Teresa. Are there any questions from council members? Council member Chambliss. Thank you. Um, you know, um, before COVID-19 pandemic hit, I was a regular rider of um, the bus uh, throughout the Twin Cities and real-time uh, services was really important uh, for me. And I know having it um, for our transit controllers is important as well. Um, given that we have um, uh, limited people using our transportation services currently um, or a reduction um, and it does it make sense to have this contract now um, can you can you speak to um, Ms. Uh, Nitzler the importance of getting this contract started now given some of the constraints that we have in our system. Uh, Council Chair uh, Barber, Council Member Chambliss, uh, that's a great question. It is a large dollar amount, uh, but this application is absolutely critical for our day to day operations, even with our reduced service. Um, we've used it obviously for a very long time. It is our main source for reporting incidents for our bus fleet real-time vehicle location, schedule adherence information. Um, all, it feeds all of our legacy systems for driver and schedule information, for real-time scheduling for customers, as you mentioned, that's so vital. Detour management, um, it's a vital system on a day-to-day -day operational level, and, and which is why we're asking for it to be um, put forward today. And Gary, I don't know if you want to add at all, uh, to that, I know during the uh, pandemic as well, it was absolutely vital to keep our operators um, up to date and manage the fleet um, on a minute by minute basis. But Gary, go ahead if you would like to add anything to that. Well, I guess the only uh, chair and uh, council member, the uh, only thing I would add to that is uh, the so as Teresa was mentioning, so this really is a mission critical system. It's used uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it's really important uh, for us to manage our our fleet. And it's uh, the transit master system is basically kind of the uh, lifeline for the bus operators on the street. So as they perform their duties and uh, picking up people in any situation that happens on the street. So they, they need to report these incidents to the control center. The control center needs to report to, you know, communicate to them to uh, make sure that uh, they're able to, you know, make a detour or uh, you know, change how or if they have to have a bus change, the service to change, these types of things. So it's really important uh, service uh, the transit master provides for the region. Great, thank you. Um, I think those ex ex explanations are very helpful. Thank you. Are there addition, additional questions from council members? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion 
to approve business item 2020-290. Chambliss approves. Moved by Chambliss. Is there a second? Fredson second. Uh, seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, Becky, could you call the roll? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. And so thank you, uh, uh, Teresa and Gary. And Teresa, staying on with us for the next one for business item 2020-291, UBSense um, sole source software maintenance and support agreement. Thank you, uh, Chair Barber and council members. This item 2020-291, UBSense sole source software maintenance and support agreement 20P296, Again, is another contract that's coming due December 31st. Uh, I'm here today with Richard Paulson, our business systems analyst, to present um, this business item. Metro Transit has been utilizing the UBISEN system since 2010, and the current system maintenance support contract is set to expire, as I said, at the end of the year. The smart, smart space application monitors and provides real-time location data and critical transportation assets and provides opportunities for processes to be visible, controllable, and streamlined. Provides key data on the location of our assets in order to ensure the best possible customer service to our valued clients. It reduces errors and notifies staff if processes or assets are off plan. From a Thrive perspective, it also supports the outcomes of stewardship and sustainability and is one, another one of our critical transportation services that we provide on a daily basis. Uh, and with that, I would uh, ask for the proposed action that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to award a negotiation and ex execution of sole source contract with UbiSense America LLC not to exceed $682,285 dollars for ongoing support and maintenance services for the UberSense smart space proprietary software platform. At this time, I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-291. Sure. Okay. Mo moved by Zarin, seconded by Sterner? Yes, yes, Chair, thank okay. you. All right, very good. Um, is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Teresa and Richard. We're next thank on to our much. next. Thank you. Um, we're on to our next order of business, which is business item 2020 292, uh, 2021 uh, operating grant applications to the funding Transaway counties. We have Ed Petrie here. Good afternoon, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Good deal. Okay, I have, the, I guess, the next four items, and they should be relatively short items, and I will go through them one at a time. Uh, the first item is 2020-292. This is an annual business item that I bring before the council. Uh, it is uh, for applying for the 2021 operating grant agreement applications to the funding transitway counties. And the action is that the Metropolitan Council authorized regional administrator to apply for calendar 2021 grants from the counties of Anoka, Hennepin, Dakota and Ramsey. Uh, there'd be four, uh, four different grant applications. One's for the Metro Blue Line, which should be funded from Hennepin County. This is for subsidy funding from the respective counties. Uh, so Hennepin County would be about $14.4 million. Uh, Metro Green Line, it would, be, it would come from the counties of Hennepin and Ramsey for an estimate of about $14 million. Uh, North Star Commuter Rail would come from Anoka and Hennepin County. Uh, for an estimate of approximately $3.8 million. And for the Metro Orange Line, BRT, it would, funding would come from Hennepin and Dakota uh, for about $250,000. Just 
just a little history on this. Historically, this funding was historically coming from CTIP, the County Transit Improvement Board. When CTIP then dissolved, they transferred all the respective funding for these rail lines to the respective counties. So since 2018, we have been applying for grants with the respective counties for the subsidy funding on, on these rail lines. Uh, right now, we are we are in the grant application process, and these grant amounts are estimates as of this point in time. I'm, I'm doing the grant reviews with the counties, and the final applications uh, will finalize the numbers before we do apply for the final grants. So once again, uh, Madam Chair, the, the action this evening is at the Council authorized regional administrator to apply for calendar 2021 grants from the counties of Anoka, Hennepin, Dakota, and Ramsey. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd stand for any questions. Thank you, Ed. Are there questions from council members? All right, um, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-292. Fredson would move approval. Moved by Fredson, is there a second? Zarin second. Two. Seconded by Zarin, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I'd, or, um, Becky, could you call the roll? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zarin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Uh, next round to business item 2020 294, North Star, North Star and Sherburne County 2021 subordinate funding agreement. Right, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this item, as the Chair stated, is for the North Star and Sherburne County 2021 subordinate funding agreement. This pretty well mirrors the previous business item I have, but this is one, this is with Sherburne County. Uh, it's at the proposed actions that the Metropolitan Council authorize. The regional administrator to negotiate a subordinate funding agreement with Sherburne County Regional Railroad Authority for subsidy funding of North Star commuter rail operations in 2021 for approximately $700,000. And this is this mirrors the other one. This is for Sherburne County's portion of their subsidy funding of North Star commuter rail operations. And with that, Madam Chair, I would stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions from council members? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve business item number 2020-294. Zarin moves. Moved by Zarin, is there a second? Fredson seconds. Um, seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Dean Nunn, <laughs> Becky, could you call the roll please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Uh, next one, we're on to business item 2020-304, a joint item for the 2020 budget amendment. It's the November capital budget amendment. Thank you, Chair, committee members. Uh, I know you've had a, a number of capital and operating amendments throughout the year. We just decided we had to get one more through before the end of the year. Uh, so this is for the 2020 budget amendment for the North or for the November capital budget amendment. And then I do have an operating one that will follow. Um, the, the, this is the capital amendment though is a very important budget amendment for us because a number of the projects that are coming in, first of all, for the Southwest line, if you recall, we did receive the full funding grant agreement back in September of 2020. So this amendment is bringing in the $928 million worth of federal funds, which we're very, very happy to bring in. Uh, we also then, if you recall last month with the special session with the legislature, uh, the council received $55 million in transitway bonding. And so we're bringing in $20 million of those state geo bonds uh, for the D line, uh, $30 million for the B line, there's $5 million left. We're not sure which one of the lines it's gonna to go to yet. So right now we're just gonna set it aside and call it, put it in a project called Future Line BRT. At which time as the construction is moving forward, for example, on the D and the B, whichever one of the projects needs additional $5 million, we'll come back to you and then recommend moving it from this placeholder BRT back into one of those lines. 
Uh, the amendment also includes a uh, transfer of $2.6 million of federal funds and $468,000 in RTC funds from Metropolitan Transportation Services to Metro Transit. So Metro Transit can purchase uh, six 40-foot buses for the red line. Uh, the amendment also includes uh, $290,500 290, $290, in federal funds to purchase five small vehicles for the Southwest line, for Southwest Transit. Uh, and it, through a, those funds are from a competitive 5310 grant. And Southwest will also then provide the local match on these federal funds. And the final item on this business or on this business item would be the, the closing of the MTS ownership of the red line assets that have already been purchased and are being depreciated today and transferring those assets over to Metro Transit. So with that, Chair Committee members, uh, the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the 2020 unified budget as indicated in accordance with the attached tables and transfers ownership of Metro Red Line fixed assets from Metropolitan Transportation Services to Metro Transit. And with that, Madam Chair, committee members, I would stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions from council members? All right, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item number 2020-304 JT. Chambliss moves approval. Moved by Chambliss. Is there a second? Cummings second. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Farber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Uh, on to the last one. We've got a 2020, or it's 2020-305, JT, 2020 December Operating Budget Amendment. Thank you, Chair Committee members. My last one, as the Chair mentioned, it is the 2020 December Operating Budget Amendment. Uh, we have just one item on this amendment this evening. Uh, this is for the North Star Commuter Rail. First of all, can you hear me? Yes, we are can. You, okay, great, thank you. It is for the North Star Commuter Rail. Uh, as if you are as you are aware, back in September, we adjusted the North Star service uh, from 72 weekday trips down to 20 weekday trips with no weekend service. So this amendment is adjusting the North Star budget for the last quarter of 2020 for the period of October through December. And it's taking it down approximately $2 million in expenses. Uh, it'll then have a reduction in uh, revenues from Hennepin and Anoka County of 1,161. And then a, a, a reduction in the use of state general funds of $839,000. So once again, chair committee members, this is an adjustment to the North Star budget, uh, reducing it from 72 weekday trips down to 20 weekday trips for uh, last quarter of 2020. With that, Chair and Committee members, I would stand for any questions. Uh, thank you. Are there questions from Council members? All right. Uh, hearing none, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-305 JT. Is there a move? Sterner seconds. Yeah, sorry. Um, is there any other discussion? Becky, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. <whistles> Zirin. Aye. Barber. Hi, with that, the motion carries. Thank you so much, Ann. Thank you. All right, so um, uh, I would propose then of all of these that um, the transportation policy plan and the two budget uh, amendments would be the ones that would precede um, non-consent to council. Everything else can go on the consent agenda unless I hear otherwise. All right, very good. So then we're on to your information. So the first one is the Metro Transit uh, Technician Update. We've got Aaron Kosky and Matt Dake here. Good evening, Madam Chair, committee members. 
Uh, my name is Aaron Kosky with the Workforce Development Department, and I'd like to uh, allow Matt, my co-presenter, to introduce himself. Yep, good evening. I'm Matt Dake, Director of Bus Maintenance. You're good. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, uh, we have a shorter video that we'd like to kind of share with the group. Uh, if you don't mind, it's about four or five minutes in length, and then we have a brief presentation following. Greg, would you please uh, share the video? No. <laughs> Never thought I'd be a diesel mechanic. I didn't even know most of the tools. I couldn't even change my oil, so. <laughs> Metro Transit, like many other industries, is preparing for the, a change in their workforce. Many of the current mechanic technicians are retiring, and Metro Transit wants to be ahead of that by developing their workforce with creative internship programs like the MTT. With the MTT program, you are working at the same time that you're in school. You're working full-time, you're being paid a handsome wage, and when you finish the program, you leave with a degree. Not only a degree, but you leave with a job offer to work for Metro Transit. At a certain time in your life, you wake up one day and realize, like, I do not know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. There's not that much of an easy in in a lot of good jobs like this. And this program provided that in and to let us reach our potential. Programs like this uh, really provide an opportunity for individuals uh, to have life-changing experiences. I was a fry cook at a pizza ranch. Uh, security and you know, you know, warehouse works. I was a bicycle mechanic. Parts delivery for uh, Advance Auto. I was just out of high school, so I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I was working at Goodwill as a uh, uh, donations attendant. I enjoyed working at the bike shop, but they weren't they weren't exactly paying the kind of wages that you know, that a grown-up should, uh, should be earning. We move people into uh, really good-paying positions, uh, and the community sees the benefit of that uh, as, uh, as these individuals are given the opportunity to grow and develop in their careers. And these careers are something people can be in for 30, 40, 50 years. And for us, that is a real game changer. It, it reduces that instability that throws families off often. They go through these cycles of kind of boom and bust. These are consistently good jobs with high wages and good benefits. I didn't really expect that going in. I thought I was going to go, hey, here's a job, show up, clock in, clock out. I didn't really expect to be, you know, an important part of this community. You know, we're part of the transit system. What this program has proven is that Metro Transit will only benefit and be stronger in the future if they bring women into the workforce, bring people of color into the, in, uh, into the workforce, and really challenge the culture. Here in Minnesota, the demographics are shifting rapidly. In order to be a successful employer and community, we have to reduce racial disparities in our community. And MTT, Metro Transit, is making a real statement with this program about where their priorities for the future are. It was worth it. Um, I got another degree out of it. Um, I did it with my mom. I get to see, got her, to see her get a degree out of it. She would come home when she was in a program and she would talk about, oh, mom, I worked on a bellow and I did this. And I'm like, what is a bellow? I've drove for 16 years. I have no idea what these parts are. I've had jobs where, you know, it didn't really feel like you were doing anything of consequence. So to come here, uh, where the work that I do, you know, it like it helps it helps people get to their to their jobs on time. It provides a, a, a critical service to them. I just have a lot more opportunities now. I'm in a way better position than I was two and a half years ago. That's what I would say was life changing. We form a safety net, if you will, an interconnecting weave that supports individuals as they go through the program. They get the unique experience hands-on working with MTT in the garages. At the same time, they're at Hennepin Tech using those key skills that they need to build, math skills, etc., to be successful on the job. And then they're also getting the social-emotional support they need from Twin Cities Rise. So if you think about it, it's like this perfect net that is supporting people and lifting them up on this journey. And it's highly unusual to see something that innovative, that unique 
that really is addressing all components of the support people need to succeed in these jobs. I used to live in my, in my parents' basement. Now I have my own house. <laughs> and I was able to do that because I have a good job at a good company and I have a good respected position, uh, profession. I love my job. I come here and I take pride in what I do and I think that's all you can really ask for. I still can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> wow, I'm here. I made it. Like, I'm a mechanic. <laughs> Thank you, and as we start the presentation, I want to um, congratulate uh, Carol Critchley for developing not only that video, but many other videos uh, that help document the success of this program. So uh, with the uh, last Tuesday's uh, celebration, we now get to, I get to talk about the MTT program in its past tense, which I've been waiting for for six years along with me and my team. Next slide, please, Greg. Um, in preparing for today's presentation, we pulled out a six-year-old slide, and that's the slide within a slide. And this is just to say that uh, what should not be lost was the MTT program was created to solve an acute workforce need a shortage of bus mechanics in 2014, and probably a decade leading up to that. Identified roughly about 27 positions at that time that were gonna be open and unfilled, and talking about just where are you gonna get them from, because the marketplace was not producing. So we looked at this acute shortage, and we decided to take the opportunity to create not only a solution, but an equitable solution. Next slide, please. So again, going from five years back to now, uh, we can say that this program created 29 bus and light rail mechanic technicians. And these graduates are representative of the communities we serve in the region. And it was a five year marathon, uh, a march. Uh, and these four main stakeholders started in 2015 and now in 2020, the names have changed in many cases, but the commitment to making this program a success from bus operations, bus maintenance, ATU, and then what is now the Workforce Development Department and HR. Um, really came together to make a wonderful program. Next slide, please. The third graduating MTT cohort of 2020, which just graduated this fall, early summer, past summer, was extraordinary in the number of participants, but also for the first time we had a significant representation of female graduates. Six of our 18 are females. And then as per previous cohorts, a significant representation from multiple communities, from the African American community to the new American communities from the uh, East African diaspora, Hispanic, white, Asian, American Indian. Next slide, please. And before I turn it over to Matt, I just want to refresh a memory or introduce this model to you. Basically, four phases. And for this cohort, their journey started a little bit more than three years ago. And they then progressed into a readiness phase by our partner, Twin Cities Rise, who we heard the CEO speak on the, in the recording. And then the phase three was a, a four months hands on exposure to get them excited and to have them try us out and us try them out. And then the last phase was just completed of two years. Saw these interns work full-time 40 hours a week and go to school full-time and then balance their life. So nothing was given other than an opportunity, but they earned the degree, they earned this position. Next slide. As a third cohort, we had the, uh, the name behind it to basically flip the switch and 250 people applied 37 started off in phase two, 
leading up to 18 graduates, a very selective program. We got the best of the best and the right way. So I believe the next slide, Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-presenter, Matt Dake. Yep, good afternoon, Matt Dake again, uh, Director of Bus Maintenance. And before I start, I'd just like to say that uh, intern programs or apprentice programs are very near and dear to me. Having, when I watched the video, uh, I was in a place very similar to a lot of the participants. I worked uh, unloading trucks and I was looking for a change in my life and I was fortunate enough to gain entrance to a Chrysler apprentice program. And that's where I started my uh, maintenance career was through an apprentice program. So with that, I will start here on this slide. So uh, garage leadership supports the intern rotations of both school and, and with their uh, work schedules. So we rotate the interns throughout the various garages and the overhaul base. And what this helps is the interns get to experience the different garages, the equipment at the different garages, because not all uh, garages have the same equipment. And they get a lot more experience by having uh, working with different mentors. Instead of being paired up with the same mentor their whole two years, they get to work with various mentors at the different garages. The supervisors facilitate ongoing intern evaluations. So we have the supervisors touch base with the interns on a regular basis, and they receive feedback uh, from the mentors that are working with those interns. And they sit down with the intern and, and share with them, you know, where their successes are and the areas where they could uh, make some improvements. And then as the, uh, the workforce development team, myself and others, we also get the feedback and we look at, you know, where can we make some changes to help the intern that's struggling? Is there a better path we can, uh, lead them down, maybe they need a change of garage. And so we can make adjustments to help uh, them be successful in the program. The technicians to support the preparation uh, of the interns for successful pre-employment testing of 100% pass rate. So the key once again here is communication and feedback. Uh, so the interns know where they need to work, uh, what areas they need to work on. And when we identify those areas, the mentors work with them in those areas to help, help them uh, bring those weaknesses uh, up to where we need them to be. Also, we try a, what we call an open house this time, and we brought all the interns in, and we discussed the pre-employment test. Now, we didn't give anyone any answers. We didn't show them the test. The key was we wanted them to feel comfortable taking the test, and we just talked more broadly, you know, such as we're going to test on electrical system, the charging system of the bus, just so they'd be at ease that we're not trying to trick them, that we want them to be successful, but they also, they have to pass a test, and these are the areas that we need them to focus on. And the garage has met the challenge of balancing intern development and garage performance. Uh, whenever you have a new, brand new uh, technician, as we saw, some didn't know the names of different tools. It does put a strain on the garage. It does take a lot of time, a lot of work by the mentors and the uh, garage supervisory staff. But as time goes on, they become a key to the success of the garage and helping meet those daily challenges. So there is a little bit of a pain in the beginning, if you will, but that's quickly overcome with a whole lot of resource that helps us uh, complete our task each day. Uh, next slide, please. So the mentors, this would not work without mentors. Uh, the mentors provided, you know, just about 4,000 hours uh, with, the, with the mentees. We had mentors at all five garages plus the overhaul base. And we now have uh, former MTT participants from our cohort one uh, served as mentors as well. And what's what I find interesting about mentorship is not only does the mentor, you know, teach them the technical aspect, but they help coach them through being a good employee and how they work through different struggles when you come into a new agency as a brand new employee. They help them help guide them along. Also, the mentor benefits, you know, as you teach your craft and you're explaining it to someone, it makes you a better technician yourself. When you break it down to those simple terms for someone to understand, you reflect upon what you're teaching and uh, how they're absorbing that, and also it makes you a better technician. Uh, next slide, please. So this was my favorite part. I had the pleasure of interviewing all of the graduates, and what I really enjoy about interviewing the graduates is hearing their stories and you hear the successes that they had. You also heard the struggles and through those stories, you know, you hear the success of how the family member helped them get through the struggle, uh, how they worked other jobs to help, you know, uh, 
pay the bills, if you will, even on top of going to school and working here, how they, uh, what, what, what they see in their future uh, moving forward from me reaching this milestone. Uh, what I share with all of them, they have their uh, two-year degree now, their associate's degree, and I've shared with all of them, don't stop now. You're two years away from having a bachelor's. And I was, you know, I love to hear, and many of them shared with me, a couple have already go to the U of M before I even shared this with them, and they're looking into uh, pursuing their bachelor's degree. So it's very inspiring, very refreshing, and I really uh, was really impressed with, with these uh, group of young individuals and really look forward to seeing them uh, in the shop as they uh, grow within their trade. So with that, next slide. Aaron, I'll hand it back over to you. Aaron, we can't hear you if you're on mute, if you're. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, this was an extraordinary cohort, but it was built on successes, especially in cohort one, where we saw a diverse group of individuals. He successfully transitioned to full-time employment, and then, as Matt said, served as mentors for this most recent cohort. Next slide. This is probably the best way if I had one slide to represent the six years worth of effort. In 2015, when we started the first cohort, this was the number of females and percentage of people of color in these frontline technical positions. And then with the graduating of this third cohort, we celebrate a 50% increase in people of color in the mechanic technician field and small sample size, but an incredible increase. That should be like 330% increase in our female cohort. The next slide is going to be in, wait a second, Greg, is, is, a, is the thank you slide, but that doesn't do justice to the book of people, former employees, current employees who made this possible. I have the best job at the council. My team has the best job at the council, not only because we get to change people's lives for the positive, but because we see the best side of our fellow co-workers here. Almost always, other co-workers, other departments were willing to go the extra mile to make this work. We're an organization that is run precision on timing and by operating procedures, and innovative programs like these require us to get uncomfortable. And I'm really proud to say that almost every single time our fellow co-workers, our other departments, were all in and did what it took to make this a success for everybody. Next slide. So thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, I This is many, many times I've presented this, and the first and probably the only time I'll get to refer to it in the past. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey, and I just want to say thank you again to all involved. And I think Matt and I would be open to any questions, if there are any. Thank you, Erin and Matt. Um, questions or comments from council members? Council member Chambliss. Um, this is um, such a great presentation to hear. Um, I attended the, the ceremony and was so inspired um, by how this program has had a positive impact on the careers and the lives of its participants. Um, I know how much uh, programs like this mean. Um, me personally, I started out in an internship program with a mentor coming from uh, a family where I was the first person to go to college uh, with my grandmother and her sister who were maids. Um, and it can have a lifetime impact, programs like this. Um, so I really appreciate everyone who has worked on this program. I appreciate and I applaud your success and not only in uh, your, your programming, but your recruitment of women and people of color. This is extraordinary and um, it's something that the Metropolitan Council and all of the management and team members should be very, very proud of. Um, I do have a question. What 
do you attribute the success to in terms of recruiting um, and graduating uh, the female? And the female increase is significant from four in 2015 to 11 in 2020. Uh, you know, it's not a huge number, but it's certainly a successful increase. Can you talk about um, what was done differently to get you to be so successful at uh, the number of recruiting uh, and the number that were recruited and the number that graduated? And that, that can be from either Matt or Aaron. Yeah. And say maybe Aaron, and you might be on mute again. I'm not sure. No. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Committee Member Chambliss, I will start by saying um, it was commitment from the start to ensure that we had a representative pool of applicants. Uh, originating the Office of Equal Opportunity, that was our charge, and that carried through through all three cohorts. Uh, it was built on trust and partnerships with value community organizations and our staff themselves getting out there into the communities and building strong individual relationships and organizational relationships. Not all bared fruit, and there were many, many failures, unfortunately, before we had our recent string of success with females. I would say that the leadership uh, at Metro Transit bus maintenance uh, was huge. And I really would like to have Matt answer what he felt was a success because I believe a large part of the success rests in his world. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, uh, Madam Chair, committee members. That's a tough question, and I'll, I'll say why it's tough. Because there was nothing that stood up, stood out to me that we had to do any different, other than it goes back to what I mentioned when I was uh, speaking earlier, and it's open communication and honest feedback. And I think that's the key with any program, no matter if it's male, female, black, white, what have you, you need to be honest with them to help them through a path to success. So I, I can't, I don't think we did anything different other than what I, what I outlined, listening and sharing with them where no matter who the individual is, they can make improvement. And what could we do? I think that's the key, maybe something that's different this time. What could we do to help them be successful? And look at it from that approach. Instead of looking at it, you have to get you know score eighty percent where you're not a technician. And look at it from what can we do to get you to be at eighty percent? And I think that's what we did. Thank you, Chair. May I um, just respond? Um, thank you. What, well, what I heard was. Um, you are very flexible in the presentation. If for some reason the person was not kind of meeting the standard, their mentor could talk to them. And sometimes you decided maybe we, they need a new environment. That new environment might have made the difference or it might have confirmed whether or not it was a good fit. So, I mean, there's some elements there uh, for best practices that I think could be shared for other programs. So. Um, very innovative uh, and uh, good work. Councilmember Cummings. You're on mute. Hello. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for this presentation. I too was at the celebration, which was just delightful. And I think what it, it, it makes me think of so many things going back originally to the fact that there was a workforce need and sitting down and figuring out okay how are we going to address this and coming up with this program the the creativity and the innovation to put this together and i mean it must have been a tremendous amount of work to to think about how are we going to address this and and then commit to it um i hope I mean, it's a model that that other departments and other issues that we that come up. Um, I hope it serves as a model of of staff getting together. I'm sure it does, and thinking, you know, how can we be creative? How can we do things differently? How can we address this? 
because it also reflects the uh, success of so many of the goals that the Met Council has on many, many levels. I think that is so important. I think that the, um, the pride of the individuals, they worked so hard and then to see the pride. And I hope that you, Aaron, and you, Matt, and everyone who's involved in this share in that pride as well, because this is truly an amazing thing. The other thing is, I think, in, and then to watch the students move on into employment and also to become mentors themselves. I mean, there is so much more to the program than learning uh, the skills and having a job, but these are life skills that, that translate to every situation that these graduates will be in, and, and that's just wonderful. It's such a win-win-win, and then the support that it would take of family and friends and the commitment um, is truly amazing. I'm hoping that there will be a cohort number four um, sometime. And um, I, I thank you for this presentation, but I thank you and, and your entire team for what you did and what you are doing and how you are continuing to address the success of, of all of the graduates, because I think it's just a, an incredible program. I'm a huge fan of mentorship and um, teaching and training and helping, and clearly this is just the best of, of all of those things. So thank you very much. Madam Chair, <laughs> committee, member, uh, committee Member Cummings, thank you. And I'll take this opportunity to um, give me my, allow me to credit my staff and my team, Gary Courtney, Supervisor, um, Thomas Scott, Coordinator, Vincent Fuller, Coordinator, and Lene nelson says Coordinator. They all were in the trenches. And I would say, along with myself, we're just as proud as, if not prouder, to see those 18 take that next step. Thank you. Additional com council members, Aaron. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Barber. Of course, apprenticeship, is, everybody knows me and it's near and dear to my my heart. Uh, and it really does make a big difference in people's lives. Um, Aaron, uh, if I can direct a question at you, um, how did uh, how did ATU receive um, this program, and how were they a part of uh, of uh, molding the program to be uh, be a success? Madam Chair, uh, Committee Member Azirin, uh, ATU was a central partner, and Matt also will, will provide from the operational standpoint. But in the creation and development of this program. ATU was at the table. ATU uh, helped craft the language to allow this program to be in, come into place. And as Matt will, will share, was incalculable the amount of support on an individual level they provided. That really made uh, the difference. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, I echo what Aaron says, uh, ATU really uh, through their partnership, made this a success. And when I mentioned, and we talked a little bit about the supervisors doing the evaluations with the mentors' feedback, we sat down with uh, Aaron's team and ATU leadership, and we looked at those evaluations and together as a group. And we, we problem solved where some of the folks were struggling of where, what could we do to help them? So we, ATU helped us along that way, whether it's moving someone to a different garage, whether it's teaming them up with another mentor, whether it was having them focus on a certain aspect of the bus, you know, more, more so where they're little, had a little bit of weakness, uh, whether it's ATU going out and being frank with the employee and telling them, you know, this type of behavior isn't gonna get you through the program. So ATU was, has been in, and continue, I'm sure will be good partners. Thank you for that. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, if I could provide one anecdote. Um, one of my favorite memories is back in the first cohort where we had all the mentors in the room, 18 members, and there was a few participants in the first cohort that were just, we weren't getting through to them. And I remember one senior ATU member 
And I just stood up in front of all his peers and said, give that guy to me. Give him to me. Let me take him under my wing. And you could just see the pride. And it was successful. This works great on paper, but it really came to life through the individuals on the shop floor. My staff doing the late calls at night and really making this thing work. Thank you. All right, additional questions or comments? All right, before I let you go, I'm going to make a couple myself. I gotta tell you, um, I was part of the council when we first started this and really some of those early conversations at management committee and committee of the, committees of the whole, all of that, uh, I could not be prouder. Um, I look at that slide 12 where you look at those percent changes and it just blows my mind. I mean, that it, we could not have or even anticipated, I think, that kind of level of success and to really provide this program that provides new opportunities for people while we were trying to solve a real-time uh, workforce need and to accomplish both of those things um, and to do it in such a holistic way as all of you have done, I could not be prouder. So thank you so much for all the years of work. And yes, I'm looking forward to cohort four. So. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. And make sure to send out one more time our congratulations to Cohort 3. That that session there where we got to uh, participate virtually was very, very nice. It was nice to have a little ray of sunshine because I think we all needed it. So thank you for inviting us as well. So, all right. Now we'll move on to... Uh, uh, 2020 regional solicitation funding discussion. We have Steve Peterson here. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, rounding out the, the end of the meeting, I think uh, that was a, a tough act to follow here, a good, good presentation. But um, did want to touch base with you. We did come two months ago to this committee to talk about the regional solicitation. Again, uh, um, roughly $200 million of federal dollars that are um, come through the MPO um, that are uh, given out to regional partners on projects and we're getting closer to a decision point and I uh, wanted to again touch base with this this group here uh, next slide here Craig please uh, so discuss what's happened over the last uh, two months uh, talk about um, over programming approaches that have been discussed by the committees um, that's that's essentially um, we have $200 million. We're hoping to provide $220 million of grants out to our partners, um, knowing that some level of, of funding will be given back as projects fall out um, of the queue. So you wanna have enough, enough to um, be able to deliver a full slate of 200 projects four to five years from now. So you need more than, than the 200 million to get you there. And then uh, again, provide any input to the tab and the technical committees. Um, next slide here, please. So 10, as you can see from the schedule, 10 days from now, we'll be uh, bringing this action item uh, first to our TAC funding and programming committee. Um, the tab will uh, approve the slate of projects uh, in December, mid-December, and then we'll come back to the transportation committee um, to concur with those projects. So again, it, um, the transportation committee and the full council won't, um, they don't have an opportunity to, to kind of pick one project over the other. Um, we have probably 40, 40 to 60 projects, depending on where we land when the scenarios, um, but you do have an opportunity to either concur with the whole um, slate of projects or return that back to the transportation advisory board, the tab for further consideration. And uh, part of the reason we're meeting with you now, um, and Chair Barber is a voting member, we do have 11 other members being with citizen reps or modal reps that were selected by the council as to kind of iron out any details uh, before that decision date um, to make sure any council input does, does get heard loud and clear by our other committees. So uh, next slide, please. Again, this is something you, that you saw two months ago, but it does lay out um, the different application categories that we do have and um, the funding scenarios that were put together, trying to allocate the money across this, um, these various application categories. Next slide. So what we heard at the October meeting of TAB was um, we brought them six different options for how to allocate the money, funding scenarios. They narrowed those down to two 
And what they wanted further options was, was how to allocate the, that extra money, that extra $20 million. Um, they want to, um, they identified a few different options and we're bringing that, bringing that back to tab here this month. Uh, they did note that most years, every uh, county will get at least one project within its county boundary, whether it's from a city um, or the county itself or some other agency operating within that county border. Uh, this year, uh, Scott County does not have a project uh, to be funded within the funding scenario. So they wanted some options with that remaining 20 million to see if um, there's a way to allocate some level of funding to Scott County. Um, so we also look back at, at the history and um, compared that to the percent of the population that Scott County has, which is about 5% of the regional population. And they're getting, a, um, since 2014, about 5% of, of this regional solicitation funding. So over time, um, there isn't a, a disadvantage there to Scott County, but uh, the question that we're gonna ask of TAB is uh, each cycle, uh, do you think that every county should at least have one project that they can be working on on a transportation sense um, out of this 200 million? Uh, two other options we put together, one was to uh, fund additional low cost projects as a way to spread the money throughout the region um, or, or the lastly, continue the modal splits for how we split the money between uh, roadways, bike, pad, and transit. Next slide, please. So the, the two options that uh, TAB is considering as, as long as well as the technical committees, uh, they both uh, follow the midpoint of the modal funding ranges. And we'll, we've got the next slide to, to go through what, what exactly that is. The main difference between the two is, uh, as the name implies, the more project scenario uh, does, does fund approximately 10 more projects and focuses on those smaller project categories, whereas the historical process um, funds bigger project categories. I will say that within both of the uh, options that are left, um, TAB did approve um, setting aside $25 million for the future F line. Um, and with the decision uh, coming back to TAB in the April timeframe, uh, but in both scenarios, uh, $25 million of this money was set aside for, for ABRT. Next slide, please. So again, the third row uh, of the table here shows the, the what, what we talked about is the midpoint of these modal funding ranges. So um, we're giving, um, and this was in the application materials, was these funding ranges and midpoints that went out to applicants um, several months ago now, six months ago. So 55.5% of the total money going to roadways, 30%, uh, excuse me, to transit and TDM, and 14.5% or thereabouts to bicycle pedestrian projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a, we, we put together a series of tables to, to let our committees know, um, distinguish between the remaining scenarios and what you get with um, by funding either the historical process scenario or the more project scenario. Uh, one thing to um, point out here in this, this table is the far right column, funded equity projects. So projects that received over 80% of the points in the equity uh, criteria were eligible for a bonus points. And we're showing that uh, before over programming that uh, those projects that we considered as scoring the best in, in that equity measure across all the application categories, we're funding eight of them. And in some of the uh, uh, over-programming options, that additional 20 million, we are gonna hit a, potentially hit a ninth, but well, nine out of 10 equity projects. Uh, so that's, we thought that was a, a good result that we wanted to share with this committee. Next slide, please. And so with that, um, I know Madam Chair, you're, you're deep into the weeds on uh, all these scenarios and options, uh, being a member of the uh, TAB committee and uh, Peter Dugan and, and has come back and, and given you updates over the, over the course of uh, every other meeting or so. So um, we did wanna, again, provide this last, uh, last chance uh, for the council to ask any questions about our general approach or, or what they saw here today. So I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. Are there questions from council members? Okay. Um, oh, I do I'm, have one. Okay, council member Chavez. Um, it's, 
it's helpful um, to kind of know what what the challenges were as far as setting our priorities or you know what was discussed the most or debated the most um, in tab um, to give that perspective for council members. Is there any feedback that you can provide about um, how how tab members felt um, in terms of anything? I mean, even the funded equity projects um, with eight out of ten, um, um, you know, meeting the requirements and and the potential for nine of ten. I'm doing well. So can you provide that kind of perspective or what may have changed mm -hmm. over time? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and um, Member Chambliss. The, um, so we we've, we've spent a, a lot of time explaining the tables and we did attach all the, the specific projects that would be funded. Um, didn't go through the, that in detail. That's probably an hour presentation there, but um, some of the main topics we heard at the last TAB meeting, um, at this point, they're uh, looking closely at geographic balance. So where are the projects located throughout the region? Uh, we heard a lot about um, the roadway projects and the fact that they're um, supplying, I would say, really um, strong multimodal elements. So a lot of the roadway projects are putting trails, sidewalks, pedestrian underpasses, et cetera, on those projects. So that was noted at the meeting. Um, there was a, a need, um, especially in in uh, this COVID pandemic, you know, where the traffic volumes are down, transits down. They said, "Well, people are still biking and walking a lot of places, so maybe we should put some some more uh, more money towards the bike ped projects and just, you know, at a million or two million a pop, try and fund a bunch of those." And uh, so I could see that being an option that uh, the tab is is gearing towards. Uh, the transit, really the big discussion there was again, setting aside that 25 million for ABRT, which was done uh, two meetings ago at the tab level. So I think once we got past that, um, the, the discussion really shifted to geographic balance and maybe the slate of bike ped projects. Um, a lot of the multi-use trail projects, for instance, we received you know upwards of almost 40 applications. And we're usually, we're only gonna be able to fund about a quarter of those and and so that's that's a perennial concern that uh, we're funding. So you know, you got a one quarter uh, percent. You know, you got a twenty five percent chance of being funded, and and a lot of those trail projects. So a lot of demand uh, continues there. I don't know, Madam Chair, if you have anything else to add. You you were there as well, but yeah. I would say there was um, a lot, definitely a lot of discussion. I think Steve captured it pretty well. I think there was a lot of um, of thought. Put towards we had done a big work group um, um, prior to the solicitation to really outline priorities and really trying to get aligned back with those priorities to make sure we sort of stayed in that framework which is why you see that um, historical uh, one was I mean there were five options we were choosing from that we narrowed it to the two and um, I think that's probably why that was there um, it was just a nod to a lot of the work that had been done to inform how we were going to do this regional solicitation I fully expect it will be a lively tab meeting um, in a couple of weeks um, to as we kind of go back through some of these things to try and settle on on a pathway but um, you know do look at the you know like Steve said if you're going to dig into all the attachments it takes quite a, it takes more than 15 minutes and so you know if you've got questions when you dig into it um, this is the first time this this group of council members is is voting on regional solicitation um, um, projects and so uh, it uh, takes a bit to kind of figure out how we navigate through this process so don't hesitate to reach out to me or Steve or Nick and we'll happy happily uh, have a discussion about the process but uh, thanks Steve thanks chair Barber um, I myself um, just went and bought a bunch of winter gear so I can get out in the trails uh, during the winter time. And I'm hoping other people do that too, but uh, hopefully we have a lot of those trails uh, paved <laughs> and shoveled, <laughs> but, um, and have good use because of the pandemic. There's a lot of uh, outdoor activities mm -hmm. as a result. 
An another topic, uh, Madam Chair, that we had, right? The, min the winter maintenance of the trails <laughs> is, is now required of all these projects. So yeah. it's a new, a new standard that uh, is put in place here. Awesome. <laughs> So any other questions or comments from council members? All right, then I guess stay tuned for your next uh, tab update after after our meeting. So thank you, Steve. Sure, and we will, when we, uh, Madam Chair, when we do come back in January, we'll, we'll highlight uh, the projects by council district, which I think is, uh, will, will be nice for council members. And we'll also pull out and highlight some of the projects because there's uh, some really excellent projects on the horizon here. Um, and we'll highlight some of those uh, for the committee um, back in January. Perfect. So, thank you. Thank you. Anything else from anyone tonight? Gene, it's very quiet and we were like two minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, we can be adjourned. Thank you.